having me here. And uh, I will try to remember to discuss the spectroscopy, but please let me know if I forget, because I do forget things. So, and uh, uh, I just moved recently to the University of California, UCLA, and uh, from the University of Utah, I've been there less than a month. So, but uh, here are my disclosure, but none of which is really relevant to what I'm going to say today. What I, what I want to do today is to uh, follow up on the presentation of Dr. Pasquale to define the differential diagnosis of elevated guanidino acetate on the newborn screening, to list the testing that it is routinely performed in patients with uh, GAM deficiency, and understand the principle of therapy of GAM deficiency. I will focus pretty much on GAM during my presentation. I will not talk about the other two uh, conditions. Now, obviously, when we think guanidino acetate, we think GAM deficiency. But there are other conditions in which guanidino acetate will become elevated. And in general, these are conditions in which arginine become elevated. Why? Because you have seen that the body uses arginine to synthesize guanidino acetate. So all conditions that increase arginine will result in an elevated concentration of guanidino acetate. This includes newborn in the intensive care unit that sometimes receive arginine, and that it is why the false positive rate might be higher in baby in the intensive care unit. Now, let's go back a moment to the newborn screening blood spot, which is shown here. I, I'm not showing it, and you know, usually the American College of Medical Genetics does algorithm to tell to the pediatrician and to the newborn screening lab what to do when a marker is increased. And it looks pretty much like this one, except that I didn't put the boxes, otherwise the text would have been, you know, unreadable. I like people to actually read the slide, hopefully. So basically, the first thing, you get the elevated guanidino acetate on the blood spot, what do you do next? What to do next is to measure both plasma creatine and guanidino acetate and plasma amino acid. Why do we want to measure both of them? Because there are conditions that go with each, uh, that can be identified with each one of these two tests. So again, it is important to measure guanidino acetate and creatine in plasma, not in urine. Children have been missed with measuring urine. So it, they are identified on, reliably only if you do plasma all the time. And then, again, if the, uh, depending on the result of this confirmatory testing, again, this is done in, the blood spot is done in the filter paper. The plasma is done in whole blood that it is separated and only a component of the, of the blood is analyzed, which is the plasma. Then the possibility is to have elevated guanidino acetate with low normal creatine. Again, creatine can still be normal in a baby because the baby is still full of creatine that has received from the mother during the pregnancy. And then with time, it will win off. But you know, depending on the timing of the test, it can still be normal. So, but again, the guanidino acetate is high. The creatine is low or normal. And then the amino acids are completely normal. So this is what you see in GAM deficiency. Anytime that we have a test, we like to confirm the diagnosis by DNA testing. And I have to say that, you know, in most patients, we have been able to identify all of the mutation causing GAM deficiency. There are probably other diseases that cause elevated guanidino acid, and we still do not know all of them, I'm sure. But you know, in most cases, we are able to achieve a complete diagnosis. Now, we do not wait for DNA testing to start the diagnosis. Once the diagnosis is biochemically confirmed, we start therapy right away. 
Now, what we know the most in the field of newborn screening derived from the study of phenylketonuria, or PKU, that's why newborn screening started. That it is a condition that is very similar to GAM deficiency in that you can get brain damage from elevated phenylalanine level. What we know from that condition that if you start therapy by two weeks of age, you are pretty much in good shape. And that it is the gold standard for most metabolic conditions to try to start therapy at, you know, within a reasonable time frame and two weeks of age is what we call a reasonable time frame. Now, which other condition can cause elevated guanidinoacetate? Again, I told you before that anything that can cause elevated levels of, uh, of uh, 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 arginine can result in elevated guanidinoacetate. These conditions are the most important, most known, is called arginase deficiency. I'm, I'm, I have a slide on the condition, but it is a condition in which the body cannot break down the amino acid arginine that reach much higher level. As a result, arginine will be funneled into the synthesis of guanidinoacetate and the result in elevated guanidinoacetate. The second condition, which is Arginase deficiency has a frequency of about one in a million. And that it is a frequent one. The next one is called glucagon receptor deficiency, which is also much more rare than arginase deficiency. And this condition, what it does, it, result, it, it is due to a, a lack of the receptor for a hormone, which is called glucagon. Glucagon is the hormone that we use to raise blood glucose when we are not eating. The third condition that can cause elevated arginine level is the deficiency of the cationic amino acid transporter 2, or CAT2, which is encoded by the gene that it is listed there. So obviously, if we find that again, what do we find in this condition? In the confirmatory testing, we will find that guanidinoacetate level will be elevated, creatine is totally normal, and arginine is elevated as well. That, that it is why we need to do the plasma amino acid, because we need to know if there is another cause, and again, most of these other, all of these things are treatable, so we want to treat them before excluding that it is GAN. One has to keep in mind that, you know, when, new, when uh, uh, new, new York State started newborn screening, one of the first patients identified did not have GAM deficiency. The patient had arginase deficiency. But since arginase deficiency can be missed with the standard screening, the patient was identified with these other tests, which is still a good outcome because the patient could be treated at birth. And the last possibility that the confirmatory testing gives out completely normal results, normal guanidinoacetate, normal creatine, normal amino acid. And that obviously is a false positive result. The most common cause, again, is that some patient receive supplement of arginine or citrulline in the newborn intensive care unit, and obviously those levels will normalize, and that it is the most common cause of having a false positive result. Now, this slide describes a second what is a GAMP deficiency. This has already been discussed. We still do not know exactly the frequency of GAMP deficiency. We will need at least 10 years of newborn screening to define the precise incidence of this condition. But we think that, you know, as of today, I would say that, you know, it's about one in 500,000 people. That would be my guess with the value that we have so far. And uh, we see in this condition the lack of the creatine peak in magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and that was one of the questions that was raised. So uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, uh, just everybody gets an understanding. What it is, it is a special a technique that you use to measure chemicals in the brain. Usually, you are able to measure chemicals in the brain only if you have a very high concentration of them. 
So you have thousands of chemicals in the brain, but only those that have concentration above uh, what we call two, three millimolar. Millimolar is a very high level. So for example, the concentration of creatine in plasma is about 50 micromolar. Micromolar is a thousand times less than millimolar, okay? So how happened that you know, creatine is 50 micromolar in plasma and we can measure that in the brain? We can measure that in the brain because creatine is accumulated inside brain cells. What we are measuring, we are measuring the creatine that it is accumulated inside brain cells, where it reaches a concentration of two, three, four, five millimolar. We, do not, we are not measuring the creatine that it is present in the cerebrospinal fluid, for example. The cerebrospinal fluid is the one that we measure when we do a spinal tap. We are not measuring the one in plasma because we don't see that one. Now, uh, one of the questions was, there are many other peaks that we see in the spectroscopy. What are those? What are those? Uh, uh, every peak that we see in the spectroscopy is usually the sum of many little chemicals that show the same chemical shift. And you see them at baseline, so meaning that, that you see a little variation from the baseline. Again, those are real but we cannot distinguish which is which because each one of them is due to the sum of many of them. Are there differences among different people? Yes. But the big difference is really the technology that we use. So when you do the MRI or the mass spectroscopy, you have to go inside the magnet, the one that makes the loud sound. Very loud. That's why they give you the music if they are nice. So, and uh, what the magnet is, depending on the strength of the magnet, you can measure more or less accurately. In the old day, we, used, we measured the, uh, the intensity of the magnet in Tesla. Many of you may know, well, you know the car, but you know the name of the car comes from Nikola Tesla, that was one of the major person working on uh, uh, electricity and magnetism and this type of thing. So Tesla is a unit of the magnetic field. In the old day, we used a one Tesla magnet. Then we went to the 1.5 Tesla magnet that it is what was used until a few years ago. Now we have three Tesla magnets that are pretty much standard with some research, MRI that use seven Tesla. Seven Tesla mean that if you have anything which is metallic within the room, man, it is going to be attracted there tremendously. So if you have any metal part, you cannot really do the, the, the scan. So depending on the magnet that you use, depending on the, uh, uh, how much time you analyze the image, you get a different spectroscopy. And that is why I don't put much weight on the little changes. Now, calling level. Choline, uh, so the three major peaks that you see are n aspartate choline, and creatine. It is very difficult to measure the actual level because what we do, we always normalize to the level of choline. Choline is used to normalize everything else. Everything is expressed as a fraction of choline. And obviously, since that it is the standard, you don't see much change because you don't have an actual number that you can put there. And one of the problems that, uh, depending on the area of the brain that you, that you image, the content of choline is different. You have a different amount of choline in the frontal area, a different amount in the occipital area, and a different amount in the basal ganglia. So if you, instead of placing the area that you analyze slightly different, you can change the content. And that is, is why. I mean, what you can see very well, is there a peak or there is no peak? And if there is a major change, that's where we focus on. Now, uh, uh, here was just to uh, remind everybody that our technical standard for the diagnosis of creatine deficiency, and again, they call for the measurement of creatine and guanidino acetate in plasma. And here are level of many patients identified at ARUP over the years. And one can see that the level of guanidino acetate is increased in all patients 
Instead, again, in patients diagnosed very close to the newborn period, creatine level can be normal still. Now, what is arginase deficiency? Arginase deficiency is a disorder of the urea cycle, meaning that you cannot break down a protein to generate urea that it is excreted in urine. When that happens, you have hyperammonemia, elevated ammonia level in blood, in addition to other clinical symptoms. These children present typically around two years of age with spastic paraparesis. This, this type of clinical presentation is seen only in arginine deficiency, not in other urea cycle disorder. Why? We believe it is the guanidino acetate and some other guanidino compound derived from guanidino acetate. And that it is why we, we, we want to reduce guanidino acetic acid in GAMP deficiency. Here, there is a therapy which is similar to the one of other urea cycle disorder, and there is an experimental enzyme replacement therapy. So what we do, we make the enzyme in the lab, and we give that IV every two weeks to reduce the level of arginine. What do we see in terms of guanidino acetate? And this slide was done by Dr. Filippo Ingoglia, who is here today. You can see that the level of creatine in this patient is totally normal, which is the lower peak. But look at the higher peak. You have guanidino acetate level. The level is about normal, is about 1, 1.2, that can reach about 5, 6, which is the level that you see sometimes in GAMP deficiency. What is the difference? That here, Creatine is totally normal, not even in the normal range, in the high normal range. So that it is why it is different. So, and that was differentiate that condition from uh, GAMP deficiency. Glucagon receptor deficiency. This was identified in patients with elevated arginine at work, uh, at, uh, in, the, in the new, elevated arginine on, on the newborn screening. How does that happen? So what happens physiologically is that when we eat, we store energy in the form of glucose in the liver, in the form of fat in the adipose tissue, in the form of protein. We synthesize protein. Now, when we stop eating, we, need, we start burning the glucose to maintain the glucose level constant. We can also start breaking down the protein. How do we... Uh, do this. So we have hormone that we release, the insulin disappear, and then the amino acids are released from the muscle. Glucagon, what it does, it favors the utilization of this amino acid to produce gl glucagon, the enzyme glucagon, favors the utilization of this uh, amino acid to produce glucose. If you miss that one, the amino acid will stick out. And for some reason, arginine will reach very high concentration because it is, I guess it is released very in great abundance from the muscle, and then it gets utilized. If that doesn't happen, arginine becomes elevated, and guanidino acetate will become elevated. And here you can see the level of uh, uh, arginine, that you know the normal is up to one-fourth in, uh, in this type of lab, and uh, it gets 349, uh, 240, 320, 330. So obviously, you need to be able to distinguish this one from GAN deficiency and not say, you know, I have an elevated GAA, it is nothing. It could be this condition in addition to arginine deficiency. The last addition to the group is the deficiency of the cationic amino acid transporter called CATCHO. So this is extremely rare. And in this condition, what you do, you are unable to move arginine from the outside to the inside of the cell and vice versa. As a result, arginine will accumulate in plasma and lead to an increased synthesis of one and, and inside the cell and lead to an increased synthesis of a guanidino acetate. Now, obviously, the way that we do uh, here it is a slide showing elevated level of guanidino acetate in the urine of patients with CAT2 deficiency. Plasma was not tested in, in this patient. Now, you have seen what happened in the newborn screening with GAMP deficiency, that 
guanidino assets, it is always increased. Creatine become low only with time. Plasma, again, is the most informative sample to confirm the diagnosis. Urine is not enough. Now, one of the questions is, uh, people are getting interested in the study of creatinine to diagnose creatine transporter deficiency at birth. Why? Where is creatinine coming from? So what we do with creatine, we use creatine for the job that it needs to do, and it is transformed to another chemical which is called phosphocreatine. But then it is degraded to become creatinine. This process happens within the cell, meaning that if you cannot bring creatine inside the cell, you will generate less creatinine. And that's probably why creatinine is a little bit lower than creatine in patients with creatine transporter deficiency. Again, creatine is totally normal in the plasma of patients with creatine transporter deficiency. Now, what is the therapy? I'm just listing them because, you know, uh, Heidi will explain exactly how to implement them. At the beginning, the first patient with GAM deficiency was treated with creatine supplement alone. And what you see when you start creatine, you see an improvement in the muscle tone. You see that the muscle responds most, you know, almost immediately. The next day, two days later, you start seeing that the kid looks different. And it is a great response. However, when they started giving creatine alone, the patient development failed to progress appropriately. So they started giving ornithine to block the synthesis of guanidino acetate, and then they started adding a dietary restriction of arginine and adding sodium benzoate. Why? So if we look at the reaction, the way that chemical reaction work, you have the two precursor amino acids that are arginine and glycine, and obviously, the more you have them, the more you synthesize what comes below them. Now, a chemical reaction only, so an enzyme only favors the transformation of something into something else. But that enzyme is sensitive to the concentration of the product. So in this case, guanidino acetate and ornithine. This is called feedback inhibition meaning that if you increase the concentration of ornithine, you have a feedback inhibition that slows down the activity of the agate enzyme. The second way of reducing the activity and the, uh, and the production of guanidino acetate is reducing the concentration of arginine and glycine. And that it is why we like to restrict proteins in the diet, because arginine is generated by every protein that we eat. Sodium benzoate, instead, it binds glycine to generate hippuric acid, which is excreted in urine. So by giving sodium benzoate and restricting the arginine in the diet, we reduce the substrate to synthesize guadidino acetate. By giving ornithine in excess, we slow down the reaction to minimize the production of guanidino acetate. That is why we do this type of therapy. Now, how do we know that this works? So what we can do, we have looked at the correlation of these chemicals with guanidino acetate. And uh, uh, these are data from patients with GAM deficiency. And what you can see, you can see that there is a very strict correlation between glycine, which is in panel E, and uh, uh, guanidino acetate. Actually, that it is the strongest correlation. There is also an inverse correlation between creatine and uh, guanidino acetate production. So it means that you know, when you give more creatine, what you do, you decrease the synthesis of the enzyme that makes guanidino acetate. That it is why you're reaching a high level of creatine in the plasma. I mean, here uh, we, we got to level of 2,000, which is a step too high. But when, when you get in the 800, 1,000 range, that it is more than enough. And also there is an inverse correlation with ornithine. So that it is why we, have, we are doing this type of therapy. What do we see in the mass spectroscopy? So first of all, you see that the MR spectroscopy 
is done in two different ways. You have that panel A and panel C look different from panel B and pa panel D. This is the same patient, same time, same day. Why do they look different? Because when you do the, one of the variables that you use when you do the MR spectroscopy is the, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, 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 resonance time. Basically, what you do with the magnet, you align all of the magnetic moments into a specific axis. And then you let the, the force, the magnetic force, go away. And you measure in the spectroscopy what you see after you release the magnetic force. In the one above, you have what we call a short time. So you leave a very short time and you see many more things, but it is much more messy. In the one below, you have a long T and you see you suppress a lot of the noise and you see much better that the major peaks are really N-acetylaspartate, uh, 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 creatine and choline. The other thing that you can measure, you can me measure guanidino acetate actually with this type of analysis, but it is not always reliably measured. In normal people, you don't see much guanidino acetate. In people with GAMP, you see. I'm sorry, I'm very far away, uh, I'm above and beyond my time, so I only wanted to point out that when you give too much ornithine, actually you can have a counterproductive effect. Why? Because when you give ornithine, ornithine is the, is the in, immediate precursor. It is uh, 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 what it is derived from the breakdown of arginine in the urea cycle. And any time you give ornithine, ornithine will be converted eventually into arginine. So there is a sweet spot that you, where you need to keep the concentration of ornithine in plasma. Otherwise, if you go above that, you start producing more ar arginine and you start producing more guanidino acetate. So I, I just want to tell you that the outcome of patients with GAM deficiency depends very much on when they are identified. And again, early identification needs to, uh, to bet, better treatment. So to summarize, Defect in creatine metabolism and transport, resulting in intellectual disability, hypotonia, and seizure. GAM deficiency impairs creatine synthesis and result in the accumulation of guanidino acetate. The diagnosis of GAM deficiency requires measurement of plasma creatine and guanidino acetate. Therapy consists of creatine administration with supplement of ornithine and benzoate in combination with a protein-restricted diet. And uh, creatine and uh, guanidino acetate, amino acid, uh, are routinely measured in plasma to fine-tune the, the therapy. Again, you have seen that, you know, we can use those values to tell you, take a little bit more, take a little bit less. I want to thank my former colleagues at the uh, University of Utah. This is a pre-COVID picture. We were almost one and a half times that size when I left. And, and, uh, uh, and also the uh, ARUP laboratory and uh, my new institution at UCLA, but especially the Association for Creatine Deficiency and all patients and the family. Thank you. With your comment on um, increasing ornithine, and you get to this point where you have so much ornithine, you're getting arginine, but the patients have elevated ornithine constantly. That's kind of the goal. Is, is the ornithine that they have elevated, is that excreted through the urine, and that's how it's not all going to go back to arginine? And also, can you comment on um, because this is tr treatment specific. Can you comment on um, any other recommendations such as good hydration for patients with GAMP deficiency and the high levels of creatine and possible kidney stones and issues like that? So the question is that the, the ornithine is always elevated. What happens to it? So first of all, uh, we like it to be elevated 
but not too much. So in general, if it goes above, uh, in the normal is, let's say, 180. If it goes 200, 400 is fine. If it is 600, 1,000 is too much. So in other words, there is a range where we like to keep the ornithine in. What, is, what happens to the amino acid when they stay there? There are alternative pathways of metabolism. So mean that eventually they will be transformed into something else and obviously become, either, uh, they can also be excreted in urine, they will be excreted in urine. But a lot of it, it is just transformed into something else and utilized for the production of energy. So that it is why it, it is good. The second question was, oh, the hydration. So one of the concerns that we have in giving creatine supplement is the possibility of kidney stone. So we like patient always to be well hydrated. It doesn't need to be anything outrageous. And most of the time we monitor the urine analysis to make sure that there are no kidney stones. So, but uh, uh, creatine in reality by itself usually doesn't cause much kidney stone, even though people have been looking at that. So there are many people who take creatine as a sport supplement and really the side effects are minimal. At the same time, it is prudent to do two things, to monitor the urine analysis when we do the annual visit or semi-annual visit, and the second thing, to keep patient well hydrated. So a little bit more than a, than a child who does not have this condition doesn't take the supplement, but not terribly more, let me put it this way. We'll do one more question um, before we move on to the next talk. Hi, good morning. I've come across in the literature at times that patients with GAMP deficiency on brain imaging may show some delayed myelination in the pons. And I've also come across on occasion that CTD patients, transport deficient patients, may also have some delayed myelination in the brain in general. In follow-up on the GAMP patients with pons, the, the altered delayed myelination is resolved. Do you, do you find this clinically? Do you believe this? Yeah. So the question is that uh, looking at the brain scan, the, the imaging, not the spectroscopy of this patient, many times there are changes in the brain scan that uh, indicate that the white matter is not developing in the right way. So uh, I've seen some patients with both creatine transporter deficiency and uh, with GAMP deficiency with brain uh, uh, MRI abnormality. Most of them I have not. In most patients I don't see anything. They are a perfectly normal brain scan. So obviously, when you impair the flow, I mean, uh, the lack of creatine probably impairs the movement of ions, leading in edema sometimes, and that secondary uh, abnormality in myelination. I think it is totally possible, and probably it occurs, but again, I have not seen that very frequently. In most cases, I don't see it. 